mentioned the capture of the former Iran. Over 100,000 people were marching through central London to protest against both plans for a war on Iraq and to demand justice in Palestine. about a regime change in Baghdad, I'm beginning to think we need a regime change right here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوز الكبير ذلك الفوز الكبير ذلك الفوز الكبير ذلك الفوز Thank you for the Islamic Society for having me here to speak this afternoon and all of you as well for giving up your precious lunch time to hear what we have to say on this topic, Mary, Mother of Question Mark. The, I'm presenting the Catholic position here today, of course, and as we know, the Catholic Church has many titles for the Virgin Mary. Some are as follows. We call her Daughter of God the Father because it was God who created her. We call her Mother of God the Son, Mother of Jesus, because she bore forth a divine person who we believe, of course, Jesus to be. We call her the Spouse of the Holy Spirit because it was the Holy Spirit that conceived the divine person of Jesus in her womb, as any good spouse does. We also call her Mother of the Church, for many other titles, as I said, as well. To an outsider, some of these titles may appear to be strange, if not blasphemous. Is there any justification for these titles? Let us have some thoughts here, introductory thoughts to consider. The Virgin Mary is mentioned 19 times in the scriptures. Actually in the Quran she's mentioned 34 times and always respectfully. The 19 times tell us that the Virgin Mary was involved in all the major events of the life of Christ from the very beginning to the very end, at the Annunciation, at his birth, when, he was, uh, when they fled into Egypt, when he was lost for three days at the age of 12, at the beginning of his public mission, of his first miracle. And later on in his preaching, she appears there as well, at his crucifixion at the foot of the cross. No doubt, our Lord appeared to her after his resurrection. And we see the Virgin Mary, together with the Church, praying at Pentecost. A very central role that God had deigned for her from all eternity. An essential role because Christ was, was true God, who was to be true man, and he received that humanity through the Virgin Mary. She was not just an eggshell that was used and cast out, but she was there from the beginning, and the only creature from the beginning throughout to the end. She was entirely faithful to that calling, to that vocation from God, to that election. That's why she could say in her prayer, glorifying God, For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, in St Luke 1, 48, a prophecy that is being fulfilled to this day. Well, I'll focus on the title, Mother of God, because that, for some, is the most controversial. What justification is there for such, for those who believe in Christ, can we find in the scriptures? Let's look at the first, firstly in the Old Testament, Isaiah, 8th century BC, prophesied the coming of the Messiah. 
He wrote the following, and here the quote is, St Matthew's quote is from the Greek Septuagint of Isaiah. Behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel. And St Matthew develops that in his gospel and translates that to mean God among us. This virgin who conceives miraculously brings forth a child, she bears that child, she's the mother of that person, that person is God among us. Later on, St Elizabeth says these words recorded in St Luke's Gospel again, 143. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? She was a Jew. She knew Deuteronomy 6. The Lord your God is one Lord. We can presume she had a revelation to know the nature of the child that this great woman, who was still only 15 years old, was bearing. Let's have one commentary on this verse from John Calvin himself, who wasn't Catholic. He quote, to quote him, he says, It cannot be denied that God, in choosing and destiny Mary to be the mother of his son, granted her the highest honour. Elizabeth calls Mary mother of the Lord because the unity of the person in the two natures of Christ, that is one person, divine, two natures, human and divine, was such that she could have said that the mortal man engendered in the womb of Mary was at the same time the eternal God. Mother of Jesus is a term we find six times mentioned in the New Testament, notably by St John in particular in chapter 2 of his Gospel. Mother of Jesus essentially is the same as Mother of God. If we believe Christ to be a divine person, then if we believe Jesus to be that divine person, then Mother of Jesus is synonymous substantially and entirely, essentially, with Mother of God. Because that person was a divine person. Now, of course, there's controversy about the term Mother of God. Its origins are Greek, Theotokos, which strictly translates to mean god bearer And there was a church council at Ephesus in 431 that resolved the issue of whether this term was legitimate. And Nestorius was a patriarch of Constantinople. He had the problem with the term, but his problem wasn't with the Virgin Mary. His problem was with Christ, because he denied that Christ was one person. He said Christ was two, human and divine, and they were separate, not united, and the Virgin Mary was only the mother of the human person, and therefore could only be called mother of Christ. The council held otherwise, and in doing so, reaffirmed the tradition that had already existed. St. Athanasius, a hundred years earlier, was using the term Theotokos in his work, Apology Against the Arians. Some of the misconceptions about the term mother of God are tragic. Sometimes you have to assume that, oh, it's a Catholic term, therefore it must be wrong. You see, the Catholics believe that the Virgin Mary is a goddess, fourth person of the Blessed Trinity, that calling her mother, they believe she existed before God, and she gave birth and existence to God. This is a common but completely erroneous understanding of the term. She's a mother like any other human mother. Your mother did not supply to you your body and soul, just your body in cooperation with your father. God infused your spiritual soul. There was a cooperation between your mother, your dad and God. Likewise, in the conception and the birth of Christ, there was a cooperation. God, the Son, is a divine person, all eternal and pre-existing the Virgin Mary from all eternity. Cooperation of the Holy Spirit who conceives him in his mother's womb. The Virgin Mary doesn't supply the divinity, doesn't supply the human soul of Jesus, but supplies his physical human nature to a person, as any mother does. And when she gave birth, she gave birth to a person who was God, divine second person of Blessed Trinity, dwelling in her soul. She was that enclosed garden, faithful spouse of the Holy Spirit no one else could enter into. And what she gave birth to, Theotokos, the God-bearer, she bore and gave birth to God. A person, not just a nature. You're not a mother just of a nature, but of a person. These misconceptions, unfortunately, are widespread. And I, I do apologise, but I think I should mention that in Surah number 5, I believe that misconception is rep, uh, continued in the Qur'an, when it says, And remember when Allah will say, O Isa, son of Maryam, did you say unto men, Worship me and my mother as two gods besides Allah. The Catholic Church does not worship 
Mary as any God or Goddess or any person of the Blessed Trinity, but venerates her with the greatest respect that should be given to any creature, faithful creature of God, predestined, vessel of election, created by him for this purpose, to bring forth the God-man into the world for our redemption. Christ without a human nature could not have redeemed us according to God's plan. God could have redeemed us any way he chose, but in this plan, Christ had to be man, to be the new Adam and our representative, and he obtained that human nature through the consent, free will consent given by the Virgin Mary to the angel Gabriel. And in that way she undid the knot of disobedience tied by Eve, and she became the new Eve, as some great saints in the second century said, St. Justin Martyrs and Irenaeus and Tertullian. Title Mother of the Church I mentioned earlier. Isn't that a bit of an exaggeration, some could say? The Virgin Mary, at the foot of the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ said to her and St. John, said to St. John, Son, behold your mother. That is of particular interest because St. John's mother, Salome, was there. The natural mother. Christ was establishing a supernatural motherhood there. St. John representing the church, the faithful remnant, the only apostle at the foot of the cross. In addition to his natural mother, Salome, received the spiritual mother. And St. John again reaffirms that in Revelation 12, 17, when he says that the dragon went to make war against the woman and the rest of her offspring, the woman and her offspring, a mother and children, on the, who are the offspring? To quote, on those who keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus. This woman is the, is the Virgin Mary because she brings forth a child in verse 5 of chapter 4. Bears a child who is to rule the nations with the rod of iron. That's Jesus Christ, the Davidic King. Title, Son of God. Mary is Mother of God. Jesus is called Son of God. We find that in the Scriptures. The Gospels alone, in the Gospels alone, the title, Son of God, is given to Christ without objection. And at times he even congratulates those who give it to him. Twelve times he receives this title, just in the Gospels. St. Matthew 8, 29, 14, 35, 16, 16, he congratulates Simon bar Jonah for calling him son of the living God. It's not mere flesh and blood that has revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 27, 54, St. Mark's Gospel 3, 11, 5, 7, 15, 39, Luke 4, 41, 8, 28, 22, 70, St. John 1, 49, 11, 27. Christ himself spoke called himself the Son of God three times, as recorded, St. John's Gospel 10.36, 11.4 and 11.27. There are numerous quotes we can look at in the scriptures concerning this person that Mary bore, about whether he was God or man or God and man. I can't go into all of them now, too numerous, but I'll refer to the following which shed more light on the divine attributes of Christ. Yahweh was called the God of glory, Psalm 29. The resurrected Christ is the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians 2 8. God is Lord of lords, Deuteronomy 10. Christ is Lord of lords, Revelation 17. God is the only Saviour, Isaiah 43. Christ is Saviour, St. Luke 2. God is a source of living water, Jeremiah 17. Christ is a source of living water, St. John 4. The Lord's thoughts cannot be directed, Isaiah 40. So too, no one can instruct the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2. The Lord God owns earth and all its fullness, Psalm 24. Likewise does the Lord Jesus, 1 Corinthians 10. God never changes, Psalm 102. Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever, Hebrews 13. God is the light, Psalm 27. Christ is the light of the world, St. John 8. God is the searcher of hearts and minds, Jeremiah 17. Christ is he who searches mind and heart, Revelations 2. Christ will come with all the holy ones, Zechariah 14. Christ will come with all the saints, 1 Thessalonians 3. Well, that sounds good, but you're just reading from the Christian scriptures, the Old and New Testaments. We believe in the Old and New Testaments, but the version you use, Mr. Haddad, in the Catholic Church, have been fraudulently altered, misrepresented, doctored. They're forgeries. They've been tampered with. That's the accusation generally that the Catholic Church will receive. Was there, however, the possibility of forgery of the Old and New Testaments in the past? 
what do we have of evidence, manuscript and historical evidence concerning the Old and New Testaments today and whether the scriptures the church possesses are accurate historically? Are they the same scriptures written by St Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? Or as some say, are the Gospels just 2nd and 3rd century forgeries or written by St Paul himself as some allege without evidence? Well, we have manuscript evidence of Dead Sea Scrolls, produced 250 BC to 70 AD. There we find the Old Testament, the same as the New Old Testament we possess today. No substantial alterations, forgeries or tampering. The Q7 fragment dates pre-70, fragment of St Mark's Gospel. The Oxford Papyri, found in Egypt just a few years ago, is a fragment of St Matthew chapter 26. The John Wyans manuscript, written about the year 130 AD, a small fragment of St John's Gospel. The Chester Beatty papyri, found in 1931, dated to the year 155. At 180 leaves of the Old Testament, 30 leaves of the Gospels and Acts, 20 leaves from St Paul and Revelation. The Bodmar Codex, the Codex Vaticanus, the Codex Semiticus, the Codex Alexandrinus, the Codex Bise, the Codex Ephraim, the Codex Amiatinus. These are all manuscripts, fragments or codices dating from the uh, mid 2nd century, 4th century, 5th century, 7th century, etc. Haven't got time to elaborate it on full, but the general principle is that the experts examining these documents find a remarkable and total consistency between those ancient fragments, manuscripts and codices with the Old and New Testament we have today. There are no contradictions in any of them with our modern day versions of the Bible with respect to the person, mission and works of Christ. Even though we find numerous we might find in the, in the manuscript copies, of which there are around 24,000, we find numerous variations, simple variations in spelling, tense, words or sentences that are missing in the various manuscripts, which are not protected divinely. The originals were inspired by God and are inerrant, but the copies that we possess have no such promise or guarantee of inerrancy. Nevertheless, there is no difference in any of them with respect to the modern scriptures we have today. The challenge is, therefore, who was Christ? We know him to be a divine person. Was his claims reasonable? Was he mad? Was he a liar? Was he a fraud? No. There's no evidence when we look at the overall person of Christ as represented in the scriptures. Are the scriptures, by historic standards, accurate? There was no evidence that shows in any way, shape or form of any tampering, forgery, etc. My challenge is, if you present a different Christ, one that is not the true God and true man, and you base it on alleged scriptures that are alleged your version of the Torah or the, or the New Testament, then please show us, please produce your version of the original Torah and New Testament, your, your manuscript fragments, your codices, etc, etc, and you show us, please, the historical evidence of a tampering or forgery that was so massive that the entire Christian world was duped without question. Because in the past, throughout church history, we've always had controversies. We've had people who have denied certain parts of the scriptures, and they are historically recorded. Marcion in the second century denied the Old Testament as a Christian, and certain parts of the New Testament. There was a controversy, people opposed him, writings were written, argument, debate back and forth. Yet we find no such historical evidence or manuscript evidence of forgeries. So by any objective standards, the scriptures, when we compare them to other ancient writings like the Iliad or the writings of Caesar or Suetonius, etc., by those same standards are historically accurate. And there I wish to conclude my presentation today and again give thanks for the host. Thank you very much and God bless. Uh, like Robert, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I, I took of the Interfaith Forum last year and it was an exciting and stimulating experience. And I also appreciate that we can have such a frank and open discussion in the context of mutual respect. I'm going to suggest some gentle critique of both alternative speakers as well as presenting my own position on the matter. And it's precisely because I respect them and take them seriously as making claims to truth that I regard it as important to engage in this way. So if you hear me uh, reflecting not only on my own tradition but also in interacting with uh, alternative points of view that are presented here, 
it is in fact not a mark of disrespect, but of respect because of the truth claims that are inherently being made by both Roman Catholic and Muslim scholars. Our topic this afternoon can be understood in two ways. On the one hand, it can be taken to uh, be questioning and making a point about, uh, with an exclusive focus on Mary herself. To be honest, as an evangelical Protestant Christian, I have not much to say here. Mary plays virtually no role in Protestant theology other than as the human bearer of Jesus of Nazareth. However, I want to immediately correct a uh, misconception that may be uh, potentially uh, available here. There are not three faiths represented uh, today. There are only two faiths represented. Uh, there's the Muslim faith and the Christian faith. Now, although at points I will uh, have a difference of emphasis uh, between uh, the previous speaker, Robert Haddad, uh, that difference of emphasis does not constitute a different faith. So it could be that we take our focus on the person of Mary, but I thought that the topic was really about the question mark, that the question that was before us was who is Mary the mother of? And particularly uh, given my uh, understanding of the relative lack of significance of Mary in evangelical Protestant theology, that I think becomes the key question that we need to ask. Who is Mary the mother of? There was a lot that I would agree uh, that Robert, uh, with what Robert had said, but contrary to uh, the Roman Catholic claim, I will argue that the question in one sense is an unfortunate accident of translation. Uh, that as Robert pointed out, the original Greek phrase, theotokos, theotokos, means not so much mother of God as acknowledged, but God bearer. And therefore says virtually nothing about Mary herself. And as a consequence, all the exalted claims that are made for Mary within the Roman Catholic Church, her perpetual virginity, the immaculate conception of Mary, that is that she was conceived without a fallen human nature, the, therefore the sinlessness of Mary, the bodily assumption of Mary, and consequently the mediatorship of Mary, leading to a veneration of her, are theologically and biblically unwarranted. At the same time, interacting with Muslim claims, I'll be arguing that the question of who Mary is the mother of, along uh, in agreement with Robert at this point, is precisely the divine Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. Now that's the only theologically and historically adequate position with respect to Jesus to recognise him uh, not only as a prophet, although certainly that, but as himself, the divine Son of God. And I'll argue that a failure within Islam to recognise Jesus as the divine Son of God has significant consequences for Muslim faith and practice. First then, if I can uh, start by bridging backwards to uh, what Robert Haddad said, and then bridging forwards uh, uh, to our, our successive speaker, uh, I'll start with Roman Catholicism. My overall claim here is that the Roman Catholic assertion which leads to a veneration of Mary along the, the chain that I outlined previously, essentially is a, a process of reasoning backwards from the nature of Christ by, via a supposed logical chain through to a particular position with respect to Mary. Uh, um, Yes, I, what I've said is that Mary plays almost no role in evangelical Protestant belief. No, I wasn't planning to discredit Roman Catholic belief, and certainly I, I have a great respect for it. I was just wanting to interact with it. <laughs> I can sit down now if you prefer. Okay. Yes, I'm being asked to speak on the role that Mary plays in uh, evangelical Protestant belief, and the answer is virtually none. That's why I took the question to be, who is Mary the mother of? And a, a, a Roman Catholic assertion, Mary is the mother of, uh, who Mary is in Roman Catholic uh, faith, includes uh, various uh, logical 
uh, reasonings back to her nature and so on and so on, and I was going to interact with that. Are you, are you happy for me to continue, or do you prefer that I stop now? Okay. In uh, 1854, Pope Pius IX, in a papal um, declaration or what is known as a papal bull, titled Ineffableus, uh, pronounced uh, that Mary was herself immaculately conceived. The most holy Virgin Mary was, in the first moment of her conception, by a unique gift of grace and privilege of Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the redeemed of mankind, preserved free from all stain of original sin. This led subsequently to the uh, Roman Catholic doctrine of the sinlessness of Mary. Sorry, Reverend. Um. Okay, we're having a bit of interfaith interaction here. This is good. <laughs> and uh, it's good to see that uh, vigorous discussion can take place, isn't it? This is the way we want things to be. And in fact, it's the, uh, the Roman Catholic chaplaincy coordinator who's insisting that I continue here as I raise some questions about Roman Catholic doctrine. And what's more, I would expect nothing less and would do the same myself. So I, I myself, I appreciate that uh, gesture. Uh, I've only, uh, uh, I was, I was making the point that in um, Roman Catholic doctrine, Mary is understood to be uh, immaculately conceived, that is herself without the stain of sin, original sin. And this led secondly to the doctrine that Mary was herself sinless throughout her life. In consequence of a special privilege of grace from God, Mary was free from every personal sin during her whole life. Her whole life. Uh, likewise, the Council of Trent declared that no justified person can for his whole life avoid all sins, even venial sins, except on the ground of a special privilege from God, such as the Church holds was given to the Blessed Mary. Uh, I've simply uh, one, one comment to make about that, which is, uh, actually two comments. Firstly, this was denied by many of the Church Fathers, Origen, St. Basil, John Chrysostom, and in particular St. Cyril of Alexandria, who was himself responsible for the conclusion of the debate with respect to the term Theotokos. Uh, it was he who was uh, uh, primarily significant in the councils uh, to which Robert referred, and yet he denies that uh, this uh, saint, St. Cyril, denied the sinlessness of Jesus. We have one quotation from Mary herself which describes God as her saviour. Uh, and later in that chapter, Luke chapter 1 and verse 77, what it is to be saved is uh, couched in terms of being forgiven for sins. I take it then that uh, from a biblical point of view, Mary is not to be understood as sinless, but as in the same position as all uh, human beings who are in need of saving by uh, God our Heavenly Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, as a, a person of uh, sin who was uh, saved through Jesus. The chain continues uh, to include the bodily assumption of Mary that she did not suffer death but was assumed directly uh, into heaven bodily. And uh, in the papal bull infallible uh, to which I referred earlier, Mary is described as a mediatrix that is a female mediator of some form. At this point again the Bible is clear that there is only one mediator between God and humankind and that is Jesus Christ himself human. And at this point I think it's, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, although uh, Robert gave uh, I found a very uh, persuasive and uh, an interesting presentation about the person of Jesus uh, as, the, as uh, the son of Mary uh, he did not uh, speak perhaps as fully as he might have done on the work of Jesus, and in particular there's a work of Jesus, especially in his death and resurrection, that constitute him as uh, the Lord, the divine Lord uh, of Christian faith. And therefore I want to swing in the second half of my presentation uh, to speak of uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, completing the picture that Robert began. Uh, in this I understand that I'm... Um, uh, interacting with some vigour with a Muslim position on uh, Jesus, uh, which in my understanding is uh, regards Jesus as a prophet of God, uh, nonetheless inferior to Muhammad, but to be honoured and deny that he is the divine Son of God, 
to be worshipped. In particular, there is a uh, strong tradition within Muslim faith that uh, Jesus did not die but was preserved from death by God and therefore consequently did not rise. Robert outlined, I think very persuasively, uh, arguments both uh, historically and theologically uh, why this is important to hold from a Christian point of view. And I simply want to reinforce that it is through his death and resurrection that Jesus is constituted as the divine Lord who is worshipped in the Christian tradition. I have nothing particularly to add to the historical testimony uh, that Robert presented with respect to the Bible uh, with regard to Jesus' life. The testimony of both uh, Christian and non-Christian scholars is that Jesus died on the cross under the Roman uh, rulership of the time. And in uh, particular, there's a quotation from Tacitus, a uh, Roman historian of the time, uh, which confirms this point. This is a very important issue because it uh, is a straightforward matter of fact that either Jesus did die or he did not die. Both, both of those things cannot be true. In particular, the significance of the death of Jesus is uh, not only in itself, but also what followed, which is that Jesus rose from the dead. And again, there's a growing consensus of both uh, Christian as well as non-Christian scholars that the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus uh, is uh, persuasive, if not overwhelming. The point of that is this. Upon his resurrection, Jesus was worshipped. If Jesus is not understood as the divine Son of God, then such worship would be blasphemous. And all Christians have been conducting and uh, 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 would be guilty of blasphemy, for we worship Jesus. At the same time, if Jesus did rise from the dead and is rightly to be worshipped, then it would be, on the other hand, blasphemous not to worship Jesus as God. Can I say this has particularly significant consequences to understand Jesus as divine, that is, that Mary is the Son of God Himself. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity within Christian teaching leads to an understanding of God that is distinctly personal and not merely undifferentiated power. It's precisely because God is Himself three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that God is intrinsically and inherently personal on a Christian conception and in particular has, if you like, personal space in his relations. This means that the way we are to relate to God is itself to be personal, and the way that God relates to us is likewise personal. In other words, whether or not Mary was the Son of God is not a mere abstract and uh, slightly obscure question of doctrine uh, which may be debated here or there. The question of whether Mary was the Son of God is a decidedly spiritual question that shapes uh, the whole of one's spirituality. Is God to be understood as a person and to whom we relate with personal relationship? Or on the other hand, is God to be understood as undifferentiated power? Finally, it's precisely because of the death of Jesus that uh, I as a Christian person understand that God uh, upholds justice and mercy at the same time in his personal relations with us. It's because Jesus, the divine Son of God, fully divine, fully human, died on the cross in our place that the Christian faith affirms that God's justice and his mercy do not compete with one another but are both fully expressed in the person of Jesus himself. Mary, the mother of who? I've argued uh, in agreement uh, with much of what Robert uh, Haddad has said, that Mary is the mother of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've sought to extend uh, Robert's analysis by including not only his person, but his work, his work of dying on the cross and rising for new life, that constitutes his lordship, and is the reason, therefore, that Christians worship this one uh, who is the son of Mary. 
Thank you very much. In Alhamdulillah, Hamdan Kathiran Fayyiban Mubarakan Deen. Salatu wa salamu wa rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To our um, uh, adjudicators and to the uh, sponsors of this um, very wisely decided uh, forum and to our two previous speakers, uh, I want to show my, uh, my gratitude and uh, my appreciation for having the ability to share uh, this platform and these views. I think that um, such uh, dialogue is, is much needed um, and poignant and, um, and should be um, done in, in, in more occasions to show the tolerance and also not only to show tolerance but to expose the historical views that exist concerning Jesus Christ uh, uh, and his blessed mother uh, and what the church, church fathers, uh, and what the evidence of history will point out uh, to these points uh, that in the past perhaps uh, there wasn't a very broad view of this particular subject. Now for me, uh, what I'd like to do um, is to offer, uh, first of all, the statement that, uh, that we would all agree about because to start off with disagreement would be to start off with a negative. Um, one, uh, we believe uh, as Muslims that Jesus Christ is the son of Mary. So we all agree to that, that Jesus Christ is the son of Mary. So that's the question, that Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ. Now all the other appellations that are given to Jesus Christ, history and documentation will give reference to that. But as to the question mark here, there is no doubt that Mary, who by the way is the daughter of Hannah, who by the way is the niece of Zachariah, who by the way is the cousin of Yahya, who, by the way, was the son of Zachariah, who, by the way, all of them were servants of God. All of those people who Mary was related to were also servants of God, and they themselves never claimed any divinity. So from a historical point of view, we know who Mary was, and we also know how she was conceived. Her birth was also a miracle, as well as the birth of her cousin John. Because I think all of us here would agree that a child that's born from a father that's 110 and a mother that's 90, I think that's a miracle itself. <laughs> and Hannah was a woman of high repute. A woman who dedicated herself to God, that is the mother of Mary. And she prayed to God, asking God to give her a son that she could give over to the rabbis of the temple, dedicate him to the worship of God. Her prayer was answered and she became pregnant. But when she conceived, she gave forth a daughter. And she asked, Oh God, you answered my prayer, but I bore a daughter. The angel Gabriel, that servant angel that always appeared to prophets and other people whom God chooses, said to her, So be it. You've been given a child, but she will be the mother of a son who will be the Messiah. And she will also be one of the chiefs of the women in the hereafter. So Hannah was given her prayer in two ways. One, she was given a daughter who would be the chief of the women in the hereafter. Of course, this is our concept, saying who Mary is. And secondly, the son that she was asking for was given to her through that daughter, Mary. That's our concept. Now, we take our concept 
not from the Muslim church or from the Muslim mosque, but we take our concept directly from the source of revelation itself. Now that's the question here. For the Catholic Church, or for the evangelical church, or any other church, the question is, do they take the definition of that question mark from the mouth of Jesus himself, from the source of revelation itself, or do they take it from, as the, the, our, our uh, uh, good uh, 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 person Mr. Haddad said, from the, uh, from the church fathers, from the councils that were held in Nicaea, whether in the 4th century or the 5th century, or is it taken from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself? And this is what we want to discuss. <clears throat> so, let me begin by saying that in Luke 135, please make a note of this. It was mentioned, and, and by the way, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four, the four, the four um, Gospels, uh, synoptic gospel writers, there's no evidence in history as to who they were because they didn't give their last names like most people do. But we'll accept that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are considered to be gospel writers, although none of them claim to have met, walked, talked, slept, ate directly with or from Jesus Christ himself. Nevertheless, We'll accept that they are writers, and as writers and people who record, we'll say that their recording could be accepted as well as anyone else's. In Luke 135, it said that the power of the Almighty shall overshadow thee. This is in regards to how Mary became pregnant. The power of the Almighty shall overshadow thee. In Luke 137 it said, For with God nothing is impossible. So this is the answer, because Mary herself was surprised. How will she become pregnant when no man ever touched her? When no man ever touched her, and she didn't walk the streets, and she was not a woman unchaste. The answer, for with God, Nothing is impossible. Now, both of these two relate. Uh, 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 both of these two definitions, Islam agrees with. For the power of the Almighty shall overcome thee. That is, the power of the Almighty, however God sends His power, shall overshadow, overcome Mary, and she conceived. And when she asked, in our scripture as well as the other scriptures, how shall that happen? The answer in the Quran is that that is easy for Almighty God for whatsoever he says be. It's just his word and it becomes like the creation of the world. In Luke 134 it says Jesus was conceived that Mary conceived Jesus as a virgin. And we also believe that. It's another point of agreement here. We believe and no Muslim can be a Muslim that does not believe that Mary gave birth to Jesus while she was untouched. That means no male sperm entered her for this conception to take place. We agree. And in Luke 3, 23, 23 to 38, there's a long genealogical tree back to Joseph. And let me just say this, that uh, in your scriptures, I don't know whether the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the Catholic version or the e uh, evangelical version or the other many versions, uh, it, there seems to be a big conflict about the genealogy of Jesus. On one hand, one traces the genealogy back to Joseph and gives it seventy-six generations back to Joseph. In Matthew, one. 1 through 116, 1 through 16, it gives 41 generations. So there's evidently some historical, biblical conflict about the many generations of Jesus Christ. This, the third thing is that Jesus is considered to be in the Bible from the generation of Abraham. 
So here we have Abraham, we have David, and we have Joseph. Certainly he could not have been from the, the, the tree of all of them. It had to be, two of them had to be wrong, one had to be right, or all three had to be wrong. Now, if we say that Jesus is the son of Mary, which we believe that's who he was, then in that case, his genealogy traces directly back to his mother, then from his mother to her mother, and back forward. That would eliminate Joseph, David, and Abraham. But that would not mean that he was the son of God, simply because he was the son of Mary, and that we could not chase, uh, trace his genealogy back to either David, Joseph, or Abraham. Now, we see that Jesus Christ has sometimes been called here the son of David, the son of Joseph, the son of Abraham, but never, ever, ever did Jesus himself claim that his genealogy was, I am the son of God. Except, in a very allegorical way, and let me remind the Christians here, in case you've forgotten, the Lord's Prayer says, when they asked the oh rabbi, and by the way they didn't say oh God, teach us how to worship you, they said oh rabbi, teach us how to pray, because that's what they called Jesus, the Nazarenes, those that followed Jesus Christ from Jerusalem to Nazareth, those who followed him, they called him that man from Nazareth, that man from Galilee, they called him rabbi or teacher. So they said, oh rabbi, teach us how to pray. And what did Jesus say? He said, our father who art in heaven. He didn't say my father. Hallowed be thy name. He didn't say my name. Thy kingdom come, not our kingdom come or my kingdom come. Thy will be done, not my will be done or our will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, us meaning me and my mother and everybody with me, our daily bread. So if Jesus ate bread and his mother ate bread, as other people eat and drink and eat bread, then Jesus, after he, he drank what his body didn't use, he urinated. And Jesus, after he ate what his body didn't use, he defecated. And God did not defecate, and God did not urinate. So Jesus made it clear he could not have been God in that speech. Let me move on to what he said. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, not mine, is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Now that doesn't sound like God speaking to himself or praying to himself. No man. Now let me give you a few speeches. Let me give you a few references of what Jesus said about himself. And let me give you a few references of what Jesus said about God. So we're not, we don't get mixed up between what Jesus said and the church fathers said and the council of Nicaea or the council of Ephesus or any other council. Let's talk about what Jesus said about him and what he said about God. So we don't get hung up on the different denominations and the different appellations and the different uh, allegorical uh, uh, explanations of what it could be or would be, should be. In John 1, 18, he says, No man has seen God at any time. That's Jesus' speech. Now, was the people looking at Jesus? Were they looking at him? Were they hearing him? Of course they were. While he said that, no man has seen God at any time. Let me give you another one while you're thinking about that one. That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who has been sent. That's John 17, 3. Write that down. <laughs> and when Jesus entered Jerusalem, this is what the multitude of people said he was. Those who saw him enter Jerusalem. And by the way, in the Bible it said he rode on a horse and a colt. Now that's really a trick. He rode on a horse, 
I mean, on an ass, a donkey, and a colt. That's a young horse. So now that's really a circus act if you're riding on two animals at the same time. Nevertheless, let's go a little further. This is what Jesus said. Uh, uh, I don't think I'm being uh, facetious here, so I don't want you to get uneasy. I'm just giving uh, the speeches of Jesus himself as opposed to my opinions. <clears throat> said here that Jesus, the multitude, when he entered Jerusalem, said they called him that prophet of Nazareth, Jesus of Galilee. Matthew 21, 11. I'm going to say what the Quran says about Jesus and his mother for last. Because first, I think it's only respectful that I give to you pe good people here, okay, what your own book says. Not that I'm using it as an evidence, but I'm just using it to say that this is what we find in your scriptures. Now, Jesus also said, when someone called him good, he became insulted. On one occasion, when a woman touched his garment, he snatched his garment from my hands and said, Why dost thou call me good when there's no one that is good except the one that art in heaven? Matthew 19, 17. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. Now, either he's the Son of Man or he's the Son of God. He cannot be both. But in his speech, he said, the son of man. And when Jesus referred to himself as the son of God, he also referred to everybody as sons of God. Because if you read in the Bible, when the son of God is used, it's used in many places in the Bible. Sons of God meaning people of God. People that God loves. And this, if that's the case, God got sons by the tongues. Jesus said, and that's uh, 1722 by the way, and also 1811, Matthew. He that receives me receives the one that sent me, Matthew 10, 40. Jesus said, I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, Matthew 12, 28. Jesus said, the Lord's Prayer that I already recited for you. Jesus fell down on his face and prayed towards God, Matthew 26, 39. So I asked you, did he fall down on his face and pray to himself? Jesus said, the doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me, John 7, 16. Not mine, but his that sent me. Jesus said, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things, John 8, 28. Now, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, and uh, 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 esteemed guests and speakers, um, 20 minutes is what we were allowed, so it is, uh, it is a, a matter of ethics that we don't go beyond our time. I would have liked to give to you what the Quran says about Mary, but I can only say this because our good uh, reverend Haddad already said that. That the Quran speaks about Mary more times than the Bible itself. And I'll go a little further with you to say this. That had the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, had he authored the Qur'an, an unlettered uh, man, had he done so, certainly he would have dedicated a chapter to his mother, but he didn't. There's no chapter called Amina. He would have certainly dedicated a chapter to himself. His name was Muhammad. There's no chapter called Muhammad. And the name Jesus is mentioned in the Qur'an. 25 times, while the name of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, is only named, mentioned maybe 10 or 12 times. Yet, the Quran has dedicated an entire chapter to the mother of Jesus Christ called Maria. And has dealt with the birth of Jesus Christ, the birth of Mary, the miracles of Jesus Christ, the, the, uh, the, the alleged death of Jesus Christ, the alleged crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and the alleged resurrection. And I say alleged, alleged, alleged. Because in my answer to my friend here, if Jesus Christ died on the cross, died meant death. And we know that crucifixion means death on the cross. And we know the crucifixion took at least three to five to seven days. And we know that Jesus Christ allegedly was put on the cross in the morning of what day? Friday, wasn't it? Good Friday? Yeah, in the afternoon. And he was taken down the same day. 
That would not have proven death on the cross, although he might have been nailed on the cross. We don't know. Second thing is that if he rose as a spirit, he would not have said, feel me, a spirit I am not. That's what he told the people that he appeared in front. Do not fear, but feel me, a spirit I am not. So he made it clear to them that was him and that he was not a ghost. And if he was a ghost, the rock would not have been moved from its place. He would have walked through the rock. So we got many different substantiations, but that's another subject. What I want to do here is say that we believe that Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ, an immaculate woman, a pure woman, but not a woman who herself was God, nor venerated to be worshipped, nor giving birth to a God, man, man, God, three gods, or someone to be worshipped, but that she gave birth as God ordered her to do so, and that Jesus' birth was like the birth of Adam, only it was less complicated. Adam had no father, no mother. At least Jesus had a mother. That's our position, and we believe that it's a sacred position and a fair position and one built on revelation. Thank you very much. Well, what I'll do is I'll answer that question since it's the first question, but I just want to say to you, I don't think it's relevant to the topic. I mean, the topic here has to do with Mary and who she is. But if you want me to give definitions about Arabic words or the word Islam, I mean, I'll do that. The word Islam comes from an Arabic root, Salama. Salama means to, he was at peace, or it means to be at peace, or safety, or with security. The word Islam means to attain peace, and surrender, and submission, and security with God. And the way we do so is through submitting ourselves to God and surrendering ourselves to God's legislation. Hence, the person who surrenders, the person who submits, the person that subscribes, is given peace and security through that and is called a Muslim. And we believe, therefore, that this is a title and a description of all the prophets of God. Therefore, they were all Muslims. Thank you. As far as the, the issue of Messiah, the word Messiah comes from the Arabic terminology Masaha. Masaha in Arabic means to rub. It also means to anoint. It also means when one that God has appointed. We believe that this was not a name for Jesus, but was one of his titles. It also therefore means Christ. When someone says Jesus the Christ, it means al Masih. Because to christen in the Christian, or according to the Christian church, to christen, it means to anoint. But the Arabic terminology means Messiah, one who was anointed and appointed by God. That's one. The second thing is that our position regarding God can do anything he wants to do. This is correct. But God has given to us revelation to determine what he has done. And this is what we're following. We have scripture that says they killed him not, nor was he crucified. And that's our scripture. Now, I could give historical reference to support that scripture, but I won't do so just in the, for the length of time that we have here. But I would say to the lady who asked the question, I could provide you with some of the historical evidence that seems to support the fact that Jesus Christ, neither was he killed, nor was he crucified, and the sense crucified has a specific meaning. For instance, if a man was, uh, was given the sentence of death by electrocution, that means, doesn't mean he was strapped in the electric chair and some electric went through him, but he didn't die, so they said, okay, go home. No. Death by electrocution means he was strapped in the electric chair and enough electric went through him until he was absolutely dead. And they pronounce him as such. 
So the fact that Jesus Christ may have been nailed to the cross, that is not crucifixion. And that is a state that I'm making. And I got historical evidence basically to support that. But I don't think it would be fair to the other speakers or to other people who have questions to go into the full historical uh, support of that. But I'm just giving you that to say that we have historical evidence to support that point and that it is a matter for us of revelation, not a matter of our own supposition or allegory. Thank you. I've been asked to answer a question. Uh, if Mary is the mother of God, then why is it that she does not get any recognition? Uh, the straightforward answer to that question is that uh, the key part of the phrase, Mary the mother of God, is who is Mary the mother of? That is God. The recognition given uh, or not given to Mary is precisely and inverse, inversely proportional to the recognition that's given to her son, that is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it's for this reason, and the reason for that rather is that uh, in the words of uh, John's Gospel which were quoted by the Sheikh, uh, no one has ever seen God, the second half of that verse is precisely a claim by Jesus, uh, it is God the only Son who has made him known. In the same way, uh, after his resurrection, it is Jesus who is worshipped by Thomas as my Lord and my God. Uh, and Jesus did not repudiate that worship, which he would certainly do as a Jewish man if he were not himself and understood himself to be the divine Son of God. Why does Mary have very little place? Because she is a, a merely a vessel, a God-bearer. The focus for uh, the Christian faith in the evangelical Protestant tradition is not on Mary, who is a vehicle, it is on the one whom she has born, namely Jesus, who was worshipped and received worship himself and claimed to be uh, God himself in the words of the Old Covenant, Yahweh, or I am. I've been given the following question. You claim that Mary is not worshipped as a god or goddess, yet at the same time, there are many Catholics who pray to Mary for help and guidance, who have her picture or statue and look at it in their time of need. I'll answer this question, but you can bear with me for a few moments. It's a, I'll give an in-depth analysis and quotes from the scriptures, etc. We believe that the Virgin Mary is in heaven, glorified in heaven with Christ. Christ at the right hand of the Father, the Virgin Mary is in heaven with all those other faithful who have died in Christ. We don't believe that the souls of the deceased are extinguished or they're in sleep, slumber, etc. But we view what St Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, that he expected to die and he's actually hoping so he could be with Christ. The obvious reading of it is that he, didn't he did not wish to die so he could go to sleep or annihilation. We look in before that, the transfiguration, our Lord on Mount Tabor appearing and showing forth his divinity, the great light that shone, who appeared with him? But Moses and Elijah. Moses had died, but we don't find him asleep, but rather conversing with Christ. The parable that our Lord gives of Lazarus and Dives, the rich man, the rich man who was sent to hell, and he's crying out, and he sees Abraham up there, and he cries out to Father Abraham for assistance to send an angel to dip the finger in water to touch his tongue, which is much aflame. Neither Abraham or the in 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 Abraham's bosom, or Dives in hell were extinguished or in slumber. But even one, a soul in hell is praying to Abraham, speaking, not worshipping, not adoring as God, but praying for assistance to Abraham in this parable that Christ himself gives. Of course, he couldn't receive that help. It was in vain because he was in hell. In Hebrews 12.1, St. Paul speaks about the great heroes of the Old Testament in chapter 11 and then in 12 one refers to them as witnesses, cloud of witnesses. What is a cloud but something above, a multitude above us who are witnesses who are aware. And like the angels in heaven, they rejoice over one sinner who repents. How do they know it's happening on earth? It's not through their own power, but because they behold God face to face in the beatific vision, and he himself infuses that knowledge into them. Revelation chapter 6 verse 10, we see the martyrs, their souls under the altar in the, in the vision of St. John, crying out to God, praying to God. They're in heaven. They're praying to God, asking. These are the souls of the martyrs praying for God to bring retribution on those who caused their deaths unjustly. Now added to that, that together, 
the Catholic Church believes that those in heaven are part of the church, the church triumphant, the victorious in Christ. And the Virgin Mary must certainly be there, well, otherwise how can all generations call her blessed as she prophesied? She's there in heaven and through her prayers can assist us. She has knowledge of what's happening on earth through God, infusing that into her. St. James chapter 5 verse 16 says that the prayer of a just man is of great avail. Is the Virgin Mary unjust? Quite the opposite. So we believe that she can intercede and pray for us as all the other saints. It's called the communion of saints, the ancient belief of the church. The church is one. Death doesn't separate us. Those who are in heaven are glorified in God and know what's going on on earth. Concerning statues, well if I was to worship any statue as a God or give any divine attributes to a statue, of course that would be idolatry. But do we regard it as idolatry when we have pictures of our loved ones on the walls or in our wallets? Or if we might look at it and have an affection, show an affection through our hearts to the person in that image? Or if we kiss a picture of our young child, are we showing worship to our child, adoring them as such? Logic tells us no. And Christ redeemed, the church shows through her practice, the artwork in the catacombs of the early church, pre-Constinian. If people believe the Church of Rome was founded by Constantine, well, the catacomb paintings are largely pre-Constantinian. Constantinian. The Church saw that art needed to be redeemed out of the hands, art and sculpture and architecture out of the hands of idolatry and paganism, and to serve the true God, and to depict those who are of God. Not, and we, show, we, can, we can show the respect, and it is respect, it is honour, and the scriptures show this in one example. There were, there were, oh, just before that, there were statues of angels in the Temple of Jerusalem. There were statues of angels, creatures in heaven above, on the Ark of the Covenant, carried by the Jews into battle. The Jews had the Ten Commandments, the first, and what our evangelical friends believe is the second commandment, which Catholics believe is incorporated into the first commandment. They had the commandments against statues and images, yet they had those statues in the temple. Were they committing idolatry? No. Numbers 21-7, God said through Moses to those Jews bitten by the snake bite, if you want to be healed and not die of the snake bite, venerate the image of the snake, the brazen serpent on the pole, which is a prefigurement of Christ. Were they committing idolatry when they, under God's orders, went to that image of the snake on the pole and not to God himself for help? They showed veneration to a sacramental, to a holy object consecrated by God. Later on, they erred. They adored the image on the pole and God commanded it to be destroyed. So we see there a use of images which is legitimate and an abuse of images which is illegitimate. And we don't have, it's not a prohibition of images per se in the commandment, it's the use of images in an idolatrous manner. And no Catholic that I've ever met, knowledgeable or ignorant, who regards statues of the Virgin Mary or any other saints or pictures or artwork, pictures in kids' books, Bibles books that many Protestants have, to be images of gods or goddesses. Thank you. Of course Christ ate and drank and slept, because Christians believe he was not just true God, he was true man, otherwise he would not have been the, the new Adam, our representative, to die on the cross, to make the atonement, to reconcile us with God the Father, to be his children by adoption. Some quotes I just mentioned briefly, because the question was, can I show from the Bible, quotes that Jesus was true God, is that right, the question? Just very briefly, Christ was accused of Blasphemy. What was the blasphemy? The source of the accusation was you being a man, make yourself God. That's how the Jews understood it, that they, when he was being given the term son of God. Christ said the following, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. According to St. John 8.58. I'll just focus on that point, and then I'll conclu conclude my answer with that quote. There are many others. The Jews picked up stones to stone him to death for blasphemy because he identified himself in the language of the Jews at that time with the name of God. Revealed to Moses, Yahweh, I am who am, I am who am. And when Christ said, before Abraham was, 
I am. Not before Abraham was, I was. I am. He's showing his pre-existence, divine pre-existence, before Abraham. It was 18, 19 centuries earlier. And in doing that, he equated his name with the very name of God, which was unutterable in normal circumstances. They understood him correctly. That's why they picked up stones to stone him. The question is, is God to be understood as, sorry, is Jesus to be understood as God or the Son of God? I think it's very important here to not caricature Christian faith. Uh, it's easy to construct or construct straw men. I don't know if you've heard that phrase, straw men, a, a, an untrue and caricatured version of a position, to then light that straw, and, but then it burns you in the face. It's actually a counterproductive tactic to construct straw men. The Christian claim is never that Jesus was God in a straightforward way in the sense that when Jesus prayed to God, he was talking to himself. That would be ludicrous. And the Christian claim never has been and never is that God somehow talked to himself when he prayed or that when Jesus uh, honoured God as his father, that Jesus was somehow honouring himself. Now the question, the, the point from the Christian uh, perspective, uh, demonstrated by Jesus' resurrection and the worship that he received by his disciples, uh, and the objection, as Robert has said, that he received from his contemporaries uh, for blasphemy was that uh, God is three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Not that the Father is the Son, nor that the Son is the Father, and not that there are three gods, but that God is himself constituted by relationships between Father and Son in the Spirit. So that uh, God, Jesus is not God in, the straight, in a straightforward sense, at least if you mean by that, Jesus is the Father. No, that's never been the Christian claim. It's simply inaccurate to accuse Christians of saying that somehow they're saying that there's three gods or that, uh, that uh, Jesus was God or the Son of God, having you be your own Father and so on. That's simply to misunderstand Christianity, to not have done the hard work. The Christian claim is that God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That is a complex monotheism. As I mentioned in my speech, the reason that this is so important is that it creates personal relationships and love as the heart of the universe instead of undifferentiated power and authority. Personal reality is reality at its deepest. And that's why love between people is not just a thing we might do, but in fact is reflecting the very heart and character of God, who is himself Father, Son and Spirit. With all due respects, and uh, uh, you'll, uh, we'll take your question next, but since the, the, the two gentlemen on the, uh, the Christian side uh, seem to be um, giving mixed signals, um, I want to just say God, as the creator of the heavens and earth, has been known as God straightforward from Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the prophet Muhammad, all the prophets of God knew God, were sent by God, and their concept of God was always straightforward. Now when it became somewhat less than straightforward, as the gentleman just related to us, as the reverend, good reverend related, uh, and as uh, Robert Haddad also related, let me tell you when it became sort of unstraightforward where three gods or three persons was one God, yet one was not the father of God, but they were all seemed to be God, and where they sat and how they sat and how they discharged their responsibilities, how it became that, how the mystery began to become a mystery, and how it became to be personal, because it is personal. I do agree that the understanding of how God is three, and how God, Jesus is man and God, and how Jesus is God and the Son of God and the Holy Spirit and how they are three persons but one God every Christian has their own personal understanding of that mystery it is personal it became personal because all of these claims regarding Jesus Christ including the dogmas that Robert just mentioned to us by the way all of this, these claims and dogmas came at least 350 years after Jesus Christ. From Paul, the Synoptic Gospels, and all the interpreted interpretation from the church came from the 4th century onwards. 
What we find, therefore, in confusion is the Pauline doctrine and the Roman Catholic doctrine. Doctrines of paganism and doctrines of idolatry of which Jesus Christ refuted when he said, if you ask me, I'll tell you which of the commandments are the greatest. Do you Christians here know which of the commandments are the greatest? Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is how many? One. And thou shalt not worship anyone except the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And thou shalt not worship any graven images in the heavens or in the earth or in the sea below. Now you tell me what these doctrines involve. Do they involve graven images, paganism, and idolatry? Is that what Jesus preached? Absolutely not. Jesus and those that followed him, they were called the Nazarenes. By the way, they weren't called Christians. Christ, he was Christ. They were called Nazarenes. The original followers of Christ did not observe or knew these beliefs and principles. In fact, they were systematically slaughtered and eliminated by the people who put forward these new doctrines of paganism and idolatry. <laughs> Did you know that suicide is among the three leading causes of death in the Western developed world? I said the Western developed world, where the semblance and the trappings of success are the most preeminent. So it really means that after all this time and the people walk away from that grave, it's over. What about that person in the grave? What's happening? Because you know and I know that death is almost like sleeping. <laughs> But that's the only theologically and historically adequate position with respect to Jesus to recognize him uh, not only as a prophet, although certainly that, but as himself, the divine son of God. And I'll argue that a failure within Islam to recognize Jesus as the divine son of God has significant consequences for Muslim faith and practice. And you show us, please, the historical evidence of a tampering or forgery that was so massive that the entire Christian world was duped without question. Because in the past, throughout church history, we've always had controversies. We've had people who have denied certain parts of the scriptures, and they are historically recorded. Marcion in the second century denied the Old Testament as a Christian, and certain parts of the New Testament. There was a controversy, people opposed him, writings were written, argument, debate back and forth. Yet we find no such historical evidence or manuscript evidence of forgeries. From the church fathers, from the councils that were held in Nicaea, whether in the fourth century or the fifth century, or is it taken from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself? And this is what we want to discuss. We believe that Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ, an immaculate woman, a pure woman, but not a woman who herself was God, nor venerated to be worshipped, nor giving birth to a God, man, man, God, three gods, or someone to be worshipped. But that she gave birth as God ordered her to do so, and that Jesus' birth was like the birth of Adam, only it was less complicated. Adam had no father, no mother. At least Jesus had a mother. <laughs> If the Imam goes into the store down the street and the Muslim is selling haram, the Imam says, what you doing, brothers? SubhanAllah. This is khanzir you're selling. This is alcohol you're selling. This is maysur, gambling that you're doing. You're facilitating 
for what ish? What you doing, brothers? What are you standing on the corner selling drugs? What are you doing? They tell them, if you don't get out of here, we'll shoot you too. <laughs> and for our young people that are in the streets, we don't like you to be in the streets. We don't like who you are with in the streets. We don't like what you are doing in the streets. We don't like what it does to the image of Islam. But we love you. We love you. You are the sons of Islam and the daughters of Islam and the future of Islam. And inshallah ta'ala, among you, there is an Abu Dhar and there is a Khalid ibn Walid. <laughs> The miracle of the Qur'an is that there is no question a human being can ask about life. Any aspect of life, but the Qur'an has given the answer. Not only has the Qur'an given an answer, but the Qur'an has directed us towards an example that illustrates for us that example, that, that answer. <laughs> Ryan, at this point now, my advice for you is that what you should continue to do is you should move on from that 13, 15 year old experience to the experience where you are right now and understand that there's a whole nother stage. There's no ceiling on this issue. Esau didn't bring no ceiling. He brought a ticket. And the Holy Spirit that you're talking about, that was Gabriel. So we're not followers of Gabriel, we're followers of that next prophet that also Jibreel came to and brought that scripture. You should read the Qur'an, you should read the life of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and not be afraid of it. Okay, and by doing so you may find out that the natural progression of where you are right now is Islam. That's just my advice to you. Pick it off the shelf and look at it. Not for its content. Look at the quality, the crispness. Look at the advancement. Look at the graphics. Look at the color. Listen to the sound. Superior. Trash. And for the Muslims, go to the bookstores and see what is available there. Inferior treasure. So the Kufar, they are making the investment to make trash superior. But the Muslims, they're not making any investment to make the treasure better than the trash.